Please welcome to the stage Dr. Daniel Biting. Good evening. My name is Dan Biting, and I'm faculty at the University of Pennsylvania, where my work focuses on microbiology and also immunology. So in my training, my, my interests and my passions really have centered around pathogens, so viruses, bacteria, parasites, and how these microbes, how these organisms do the things they need to do to cause disease. But because I'm an immunologist, I also think about the other side of that coin. How does our immune system fight off these pathogens to restore us to a state of health? Now, what I'm here to tell you tonight is that Although that's a good way to think about training, and I certainly uh, enjoyed being trained to think about both microbes and the host immune response, I think that training doesn't really equip us for the future of microbiology, for the future of, of medicine. Now, that's not to say that there aren't a lot of important pathogens. In fact, just two years ago, West Africa was in the throes of a major Ebola outbreak that had a devastating impact, not just on the people that were infected, but also on the communities and the countries that tried to cope with this outbreak. Now, that outbreak has largely come and gone, but we now find ourselves in the throes of yet another uh, viral outbreak, one that's received a lot of attention and press lately, and that's Zika virus. Infections of women are thought to be associated with major birth defects and developmental defects in children that were um, being carried by those women at the time they were infected. So, indeed, if you walk into any microbiology course, at the veterinary school where I work or across the street from us in the medical school, and you sat down and opened their textbook or pulled out their syllabus, you would see another collection of organisms that cause disease. In fact, that's the only thing these organisms have in common, or one of the only things. They're all associated with disease. That's actually why veterinary students and medical students are spending their time studying them. Because when they go out and practice medicine, they're gonna need to be able to identify to diagnose and to treat the diseases that arise from these bacterial pathogens. But there's one other thing they have in common that's perhaps not so apparent, and that's that all of these organisms can at least in some way be cultured or grown in a laboratory. That might not seem like such an important thing, but it's actually the single thing that has brought them all into one textbook, all into one course because it's our ability to culture and grow and work with these organisms in a laboratory that really allows us to understand their biology, what they're doing, and in fact, test antibiotics on them and find out what we can use to treat patients infected with these organisms. But what I'm here to tell you today is that microbiology has long had a dirty little secret. And it's not that they were trying to hide this from the rest of the public or the scientific community, but it's more that microbiologists didn't really know what to do with this information, how to interpret it and what it meant. And that's this simple fact, that most microbes do not cause disease at all. Now, we study the ones that cause disease because, of course, we need to know how to treat them, but most microbes do not cause disease. The other important fact is that the vast majority of life on this planet is microbial, and in fact, most of that is bacterial. And so we're walking around in a microbial world of which we know almost nothing about because they can't be cultured and they don't cause disease. So you don't have to look very far in this microbial world to find examples of this. In fact, go to extreme environments. This, for example, is one of those extreme environments. This is Black Sand Pool in Yellowstone National Park. This is a, a hot spring. In fact, hot is an understatement. This can reach about 200 degrees Fahrenheit, so the boiling point. Not a place you would think life would thrive. But yet, early microbiologists traveled to this place to ask exactly that question. And they essentially went fishing, not for fish per se, but for microorganisms. They dipped microscope slides suspended from a string into the pool. And what they did was they assumed that if bacteria were there, they would eventually bump into the slide and stick. And as bacteria often do, once they're in one place, and if they're growing, they'll form a colony. Now, if you pull these fishing lines out at different times, and you count the number of colonies, and the size of those colonies, you can understand whether bacteria are there, and if so, how fast they're growing. The results of these studies were simple and yet, at the same time, transformational. What they showed that was that not only could life live in this 200 degree Fahrenheit pool, but it could thrive there. Now, you don't need to go to extreme environments. In fact, you could walk right outside, scoop up a handful of soil, bring it over to one of the laboratories, mix a little bit of that soil with water to make a slushy, and spread that out on a Petri dish. And if you waited overnight, inevitably, bacteria would grow. And in fact, if you counted those bacteria, 
if you counted those bacteria, what you would see is that there are at least, probably in the ballpark, of four million bacteria per gram of soil. That's great, it seems like a lot, it is a lot, but if you did the same thing, you took the same slurry and you put it, instead uh, on a culture plate, you put it on a plate and you labeled it with a dye that let you see anything that had DNA, so any bug there is gonna fluoresce. If you turned off the lights and you hit that plate with, uh, with a UV light, what you would see would be the equivalent of a microbial starry night sky. Now you could count each of those fluorescent spots and you'd come up with a number that's not 4 million, not 40 or even 400 million bacteria per gram, but 40 billion bacteria per gram. So by depending on culture, what the, the world of microbiologists has depended on for a very long time, we were grossly underestimating the diversity of life, the ecosystem within even something as simple as soil. So what do you do? What do you do if you can't culture something? How do you know what it is? How do you know if it's even there or what it might be doing? Well, that answer came relatively recently in microbiology, and that's this beautiful molecule here. This is the 16S ribosomal rRNA gene, and it's a gene who's transcribed into RNA, but not translated into protein. The RNA is folded into this beautiful structure and serves its cellular purpose as an RNA molecule. So scientists figured out that you could take this molecule and essentially read it as a genomic fingerprint or a signature that would be unique for all forms of life. Now there are a few features of this molecule that make it particularly good for this purpose. One is it's found across all life. My cells have this, your cells have this molecule. The bacteria in that soil sample I just showed you have this molecule. It's also functionally constant, meaning it does the same thing in those bacteria that it does in my cells. It's also highly abundant, and that's important because if I'm gonna study a rare population of bacteria that only exist in a, in a hot spring in Yellowstone, I wanna know that when I crack open those bacteria, the signature I'm looking for is one of the most abundant molecules in that cell. And then lastly, and very importantly, these different parts that are colored differently here evolve and change at different rates. And that's really important because it means that those bacteria in the soil, even though they have the same gene as me, our signatures look different because they've been evolving at different rates. And so you can tell my 16S rRNA gene apart from that bacteria, you can also tell the bacteria apart from each other at the species level oftentimes. So that's led to this revolution in microbiology. And as Norman Pace said, microbiology can now be viewed as a whole science. The organism can be studied within its ecosystem, within that soil, within that hot spring, without the need to culture them, without the need to grow or work with them in a laboratory. And that's led to this idea of something called a microbiome. So what is a microbiome? Well, it's a microbial community that occupies a reasonably well-defined habitat which has distinct physiochemical properties. This concept of a microbiome has really started to change the way we think about ourselves and the way we think about medicine and biomedical research. We're no longer maybe uh, viewed as a single sort of silhouette entity here, but instead are an ensemblage of species not unlike a beautiful coral reef that you see here. And so the idea of health then, if we want to consider a comprehensive idea of health moving forward to the future, it's considering not just our body, not just our internal organs, our blood pressure, our heart rate, but it's also considering the ecosystem that we carry along with us because just like the soil and just like that, uh, that hot spring, we carry a massive amount of bacteria on our skin, in our intestine, and in the urogenital tract. In fact, that microbiome, our microbiome, your microbiome, actually is more numerous perhaps than the cells that make up your own body. So we are part human, part microbe. So that has led to this notion that has really exploded across the face of science, not just scientific journals that I would read in my work, but also lay publications like the New York Times, The Economist, journals and magazines everywhere now thinking about what this means to carry around with us our microbial passengers. And if you open the covers of any of these, you will see many, many uh, discussions, many research studies talking about human health. And that's really important because we all care about human health. But you'll also see a lot of studies that focus on mice, 
That's also important because mice are a great laboratory model to understand other animals and humans. But I would argue, coming from a veterinary school, that there's a piece that's largely missing from this, and we would re be remiss not to consider it. And that's our fellow companion animals, our cats and our dogs, our pets, but also our agricultural animals that we depend on for food. So why can we learn more about microbiology from our animals? Well, just like us, these animals carry around their own microbiome. And that microbiome can influence everything from milk production in a dairy cow to the development of disease in our favorite beloved pet. So it turns out companion animals develop spontaneous disease just like humans do. And we believe that spontaneous disease could in part be driven by the microbiome. So if we want to study spontaneous disease, going from being healthy one week to sick the next, we can learn a lot about that process by studying the, uh, the animals that we live and work with every day. Our pets also share our environment. And that's really important because when we talk about disease, we talk about potentially two general factors, genes and environment. And environment's always this murky area that we don't quite know what the factors are that, that are driving that environmental influence. Well now, it's reasonable to think about the microbiome being at least a part of that environmental influence. And if we want to know what that role of the environment is in disease development, then we'd like to be thinking about animals that share our environment, to sit on the couch with us. Uh, not ones that are, uh, not, not mice, for example. Now, another factor in understanding the microbiome is diet. It's been thought for a long time that when you eat, you're not just eating for yourself, you're eating for two. You're eating for your own caloric needs, but you're also feeding this microbial community that is in mass in your gut. And those microbes use that food source and degrade it, break it down, and produce metabolites that you also need. So diet and its role in influencing the microbiome is really hard to study in humans because everybody has eaten different things today. But our pets get very consistent diets, very formulated diets. Our agricultural animals get very consistent diets. And so there's a real potential there to understand the role of diet on influencing the microbiome. And I'll end with this. We think a lot about antibiotic use, not just for the, its good, but for its potential downside. Antibiotics have long been used in agricultural medicine to boost animal productivity. And if we want to think about how veterinary medicine can influence the development of antibiotic-resistant superbugs, we need to think about how our antibiotics are used in agriculture and how they might influence the microbiome. Over 70% of global antibiotic, an antibiotic sales are, go to agricultural animals and companion animals. So this is a really critical need. It's a future not only for veterinary medicine, but I would argue that veterinary medicine is a future for microbiology to help us understand how our community of microorganisms influence our health and our disease. Thank you.